Hello everyone, I'm going to give you Gettysburg now, and uh, where to start is difficult. I'm going to start with a quote by a very good historian named Jay Winnick, and Winnick said that there have been no better generals than Robert Edward Lee, and I'm, I'm misquoting it horribly now, but he said there have been no such better generals than Robert Edward Lee, and despite that, it left Gettysburg as a puzzlement. A, 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 a curiosity of why he failed. And it is something to ponder because at what we last left off, Lee had just won his most famous battle uh, and that's Chancellorsville. And the thing to start is start from there. With Chancellorsville, Lee believed that he had demoralized the North. He believed he's coming off of that incredible victory in May of 1863. And the South, remember, the one thing the South, their whole goal is really just not to lose. In other words, they want independence. Okay, same thing with the Americans dealing with the Brits. Uh, they don't have to defeat the British. They don't have to go over to England and conquer them or anything like that. Uh, they just have to have the British get tired and go away. And this is the same effect. So the South's really fighting a defensive war. But you know this by now. Lee is always about the initiative. He's about taking risks. He's about being on the offensive. That's important as we move towards Gettysburg and understanding this. The decisive victory at, at Chancellorsville, the idea that Lee had defeated completely. Hooker's a beaten man, in other words. And Hooker's still in charge of the army, as far as Lee knew. Um, this would prove to be false. Um, a new general is going to come in. And the other part of it is, as you move to Gettysburg, uh, remember we talked about policy and strategy in the beginning. You have to have a meshing of these. This is going to kind of rip apart for the South. When you get into Lee now and Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy. And there's a tremendous amount of history here. And I apologize. I'm going to have to do this real quick. But anyway, um, in other words, I'm leaving a lot out. And uh, so here it is. Is Lee, the decision by Davis was to send Lee west. Because there's this guy out there named uh, Ulysses Grant who's causing problems for this place called Vicksburg. And so Lee pondered this. And he argued with Davis that this would be a terrible idea. Lee's decision is to take the fight to the north. What Lee had done is he, he not only had the defeat of Hooker on his mind, uh, but he had read um, he read a lot of the northern newspapers. Now, the war in the north was not as unified and solid as most people believe. You had a group of people known as Peace Democrats. Peace. Uh, they were known as Copperheads by a lot of northern Republicans, uh, the dangerous venomous snake. And the idea was that there was this sense in the North to get out of the war. I mean, think about it. Uh, this is it. Sue for peace. You know, one good quick victory would do it. Think about why Lee would go North. He's not going to go up North. You know, I mean, he's farther North than D.C. It's not about conquering D.C. It's about inflicting damage and demoralizing. That's really the key word you got to keep coming back to because it's written all the time. Lee's notes and all these others. Um, so he won out in an argument against Davis. Davis's idea is you got to go to the West. Uh, the West wasn't doing very uh, well. Uh, the North was actually being very victorious in the West. The South of it weren't doing very well. The blockade, by the way, the naval blockade is starting to tighten, have some effect on the South by 1863. So there's some good news for the North. The other part in the South is, uh, as far as the clock is running, inflation is starting to really take a deep bite into the Southern economy. Um, and what's fun is you, there's so many books, like I said, on this. What's fun to read or you got these, you got these, these women in the South. A lot of the men were off to war, and they're writing. They're writing these letters to Jefferson Davis about how everything's going on in the plantation. You know, and the slaves just refused to, to listen to them, so they would have to go out and find some man to come over and you know beat and whip the slaves. And so these women are writing these notes, and they're writing them not on paper. They're writing them on like wallpaper and stuff, whatever they can find, and they're writing them to Jeff Davis, complaining. But they're complaining a lot about eggs and the prices and flour and all this other. It's a really interesting insight into the idea of the of if the North was having a demoralizing effect. The South had just as much. So it's about who can get this done first. And, and probably in Lee's mind was Napoleon. Napoleon, by winning a major victory, you can get the peace table. Okay, and you get the North of the peace table. You can say, okay, here's the deal. You leave us alone. You give us our independence. You recognize us as an independent country. Okay, so this is the idea of moving north. And as Lee moved north, he moved north as the normal fashion. Remember Antietam. He's going to split his forces. 
And as his forces were split, they move up into the Pennsylvania region, and they're up there foraging and, and doing all kinds of things. And he believed this would gain support. Uh, it did the very opposite. Uh, the northerners up there didn't like him being up there. Uh, he would take things. He would take their cattle. He'd take their horses and so on like this. And then he'd pay him Confederate money. Um, and so actually it galvanized a lot of the Democrats uh, for, the, for the support of this. Um, he actually, they captured, they captured uh, blacks and put them into, into slavery. This is not helping uh, his cause. So it had the very opposite effect. Now, the key idea is when Lee moved up into the north, um, into Pennsylvania, there's three things that really matter. One, remember, Jackson's dead. Hard for dead guys to be there. Jackson's dead, so Lee elevated a, a man to the command, two guys, in fact, to the command of, of Jackson. One was named Richard Ewell, E-W-E-L-L, -L, he's key, and then A.P. Hill. Both good commanders that served under Jackson. Both tough men, aggressive, Lee liked this. Remember this about Ewell, E-W-E-L-L. -L. The second thing that is also very important as you remember this with Lee as he began to move north uh, is, is not only has he got a new commander, Jackson's no longer there, but the other part of it is the Union Army is now under the command of a guy named George Meade. Meade is not Hooker, he's different. And the Union Army was not demoralized. The Union Army is actually in pretty good shape. And, and uh, Meade's out there with about 86,000 men, uh, and he's looking for Lee. Okay, so that's, that's the two main things. And then the third and the final thing is as you move into this idea is there's James Long, or he's without his eyes. Excuse me, before I get to launch it. There he's without his eyes. He's blind. Stewart's off somewhere else. Remember, Stewart's a recon guy. Those are the three key things you have to keep in mind. The fourth thing to add in is Longstreet is mainly a, a master of defensive uh, tactics. And Longstreet, because of that idea of being a defensive-minded guy, once Gettysburg gets going, Longstreet's going to take a long look at the fortifications that the Yankees had there on the hills. And he's going to tell Lee, this is not a good idea. Lee's mind is different than Longstreet in this case. It's about Lee's famous line, they are there, we're here, this is the fight. This is the big haymaker I'm going to land, and it's going to end it. Lee is now going to make the mistakes that previously had been in the hands of the Union. Okay, so how do we start? Um, real brief, a map. Okay, what you got to notice, the most important thing is notice the Union lines are going to take this fish hook shape. This is very famously known. And if you notice, when you start looking at the map, you got these names like top. Hill, Ridge, okay, likewise, so they're all high ground. The other part of it is the Confederacy is going to mirror it, but the lines of the Confederacy is going to be much more spread out, not as concentrated. Very important in war is the ability to shift lines, and the ability for communication. This is going to matter. Those are key. Okay. Now, the Battle of Con Gettysburg's accidental. It's not, there's no strategic position or reason to have Gettysburg. Uh, what the people of Gettysburg wrote a lot about is this new ice cream shop that they got. Okay, so anyway, but it's got seven roads that come into it. And what's going to happen is, as Lee's group is spread out, uh, Ewell and Hill are going to run into a group of Yankees. And this is just to the north of the town of Gettysburg. And this is July 1 of 1863. It's hot. So what's going to happen is Ewell and Hill engage this group under Buford, a guy named Buford, uh, John Buford, uh, for the, uh, for the uh, uh, Union. What's going to happen is they engage. And the other thing is interesting about Gettysburg is this is the first time Union cavalry met Confederate infantry. Usually it was the opposite. And so what's going to happen is the, the, the uh, Confederate infantry is going to push the Yankees back. And the Yankees are going to be pushed back through uh, the cemetery, ironically, where Gettysburg is at. And then you're going to end up on this position known as Culp's Hill. Culp's Hill's to the north. And Culp's Hill, this is south of Get town of Gettysburg. And Culp's Hill, as it's there, the Yankees are going to take a fortified position. You'll now send message back to Lee saying, look, here they are. Uh, we're, we've been engaged. And Lee basically said, I don't want anything done until I get there. Wait till the army concentrates. But he sent to Hill in the note, Something he would normally say to Jackson. Jackson's dead. He said, take hill, take the hill 
if practicable. Key, if practicable. Now, what did he mean? This is one of the biggest questions. Gettysburg's got a lot more questions than answers. And there's so much written on it. But the bottom line is, if practical, really meant find a way to get it done. Scout it out. Get it. Take the initiative. This is Lee. This is the argument here. Who's at fault? Was it Yule? Was it Lee? The argument a lot of times by really good historians falls on Lee. Okay, because Lee should have been clear in the communication, but Lee is also the guy who says, I want to take this. I want to, I want to be offensive. This is the initiative. Yule did try to take, uh, or Yule didn't take the hill, excuse me. He sighed, he looked at it, the sun began to set, and he realized the Yankee position was too strong. And what's going to happen is both armies now came to run and realizing that's where they're at. And Gettysburg then set up in the fashion I just showed you. On July 1 and into July 2, July 1 is all about positioning. July 2 now, Lee's there, Longstreet's there. Longstreet took a long look at what the Yankee lines were like. He went back to Lee and said, this is not a good idea. These are good defensive positions. And that's a good sp situation. You got the Yankee artillery. And, the, and these guys don't look too demoralized to me. So what's going to happen is Lee, as he arrived in that late afternoon, is going to argue back and say, they're here, I'm here, we're going to get this done. And so what's going to happen is he's, Lee's going to argue, uh, this is how the, the attack's going to go. He argued Longstreet to get into position and move to the southern part, to the left flank, okay, of the Yankee line down here. And what's going to happen is Longstreet and Ewell are both going to attack these two flanks, sound familiar, and then hope that Meade's going to weaken the middle. Yes, it's the old Antietam strategy. It's normal. And so the idea is he's going to weaken the middle. When he did, then Lee's going to hit him with a with a major punch right in the middle. But it's not only going to be just a punch. He's got something else planned. I'll get to in a minute. But he's without cavalry, Stuart. So the first, the July 2nd is about Longstreet getting in a position. Longstreet took a long time to get in position. Now, this is also is the second question. Why? And various answers. One, Longstreet got lost. Okay. Once again, he's not, he didn't really have a lot of understanding of Pennsylvania, uh, the, the land. And then two, uh, the argument is he had to go undetected. So he had to kind of do these counter marches uh, to stay out of the watchful eyes of the Yankees. And he had to get his men in position. And by the time he did, he's going to be late. Ewell on the other side is waiting for, to hear this. He's waiting for this sound, this signal of when Longstreet launched, then Ewell would go. So everything's on a delay hesitation <laughs> is now in the hands of the Confederates. The Yankees, meanwhile, are well defended. They have a well defensible position. On the south, to the south, where Longstreet's going to attack is this area known as Little Round Top. And there's all kinds of stories about Gettysburg and Little Round Top, and it's really, really awesome to read. Uh, the reality goes back to the fact that on Little Round Top is a man named uh, he's going to be one of the most famous guys. There's, there's Sickles. Uh, uh, Sickles is, is just an unbelievable uh, 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 character uh, to read about. He's a New York politician, Daniel Sickles, and uh, ended up getting in command there in the Union Army. And he is just something else to read about. He's a scoundrel and a half. And Sickles is actually going to abandon his position, put his men into a very dangerous situation. This is down near Devil's Bend in the Peach Orchard. What's going to happen? And it's going to it's going to be this race for a little round top. Whoever can get the high ground now commands basically the line. Uh, and it's going to be the a man named Major Joshua Chamberlain uh, out of the state of Maine who's going to save little round top and keep that for the Union. Absolutely important. Um, so when day two finally ended, the positions remained the same. And now Stewart had shown up. And Lee now is going to launch his final attack. He believed that Meade had weakened the center. And now this became known what's going to become the famous Pickett's Charge. About 15,000 men under George Pickett, a, 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 a really fun Cavalier Virginian to read about, who's going to go ahead and have the honor to attack this frontal part of the Union Army at its strongest point, believing though it's been weakened. Now, whenever you look at this, be very careful. It is not just a full frontal massacre. Lee is also going to take Stuart and have him go all the way around with his cavalry and simultaneously attack the Yankees from the rear. So here's the setup for July 3rd. As the day goes, the Confederates are going to open a barrage of artillery, blasting the Yankee line, supposedly taking the Yankee guns out. 
This would be uh, prognosticating, looking forward to something similar to a uh, World War I charge. You, you blast them all your artillery, you get up and you think, okay, we're going to march across and everything's going to be fine. This is absolute foolishness. They don't really hit. It's not, it's not effective. The artillery is not effective. Um, and then what's going to happen is as Pickett's men all came out and charged from under these trees, they're going to go forward. The Yankees are going to start blasting them. Now, what happened to, what happened to the cavalry charge? What happened to, to uh, Stuart? He got into position. He makes this long round. And all of a sudden, these, these, these uh, uh, Confederate cavalry are coming. Okay, they're supposed to simultaneously kind of come together. It's actually pretty genius. Who's there? None other than George Custer. He's a union. He's from the state of Michigan. He's a union guy. He's a Wolverine. And George Custer looks out and he sees the cavalry of, of, uh, of, of uh, uh, Stuart. And they knew each other. And, and, and then what happened is he did the normal Custer thing. He gathered his, his cavalry together. George Custer charged headlong right into Stuart. Only George Custer. And this stopped Stuart's advance. It's just unbelievable when you really sit down and read about the Battle of Gettysburg. Get a good historian. Stephen Sears is excellent. James McPherson is excellent. Wonderful book. And I'm bringing it in here. It's called Hallowed Ground. You basically walk Gettysburg uh, by reading it. It's a thin, wonderful book. And I apologize. I'll show it to you next time if I can remember this. So what's going to happen at the end of this is um, Gettysburg ended with everyone in those positions. But let me say the word demoralized. Lee's now, and his men are demoralized. This has kind of caused some problems. Uh, Lee's army is still intact. Meade is still there. Meade actually anticipated Lee's attack. This is, you got to give credit to Meade. And at the end, on July 3rd, when the sun was setting, and July 4th is going to be the next day, very famous state of American history now, isn't it? Um, what's going to happen is the positions remain the same and unchanged. Uh, the message is sent to uh, by a telegraph uh, to Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln is in great spirits. He believes the war is over. He believes Lee's been defeated. This is wrong. Lee would sit there in that position for a while. And then he would slink across in the, in the dark uh, back down into uh, Virginia. And then Lincoln would realize one thing. The war had to continue. However, Lee would lose a tremendous amount of his men, one third of his army. This is not good. Uh, yet Lee's army is still intact. Lincoln realized uh, more men had to die. The war would continue until the hand was closed on Lee's army. Uh, so Lee, Lincoln at that time didn't want to do anything harsh or rash, uh, but Meade was out <laughs> as commander. Uh, Lee, Lincoln now had to find his guy. Now quickly before I get to that guy who was in the West at the exact same time. So when Gettysburg's going on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, Grant's out in Vicksburg. And so Grant's star is going to begin to rise because of that. We'll get to Vicksburg next. Um, the other part about Gettysburg, not to lose sight on this, is the Gettysburg Address. And uh, here's something I will send you if you want. This is my piece on Gettysburg. Uh, the Gettysburg Address is the one thing I would have people read. If you haven't read it, read it and read it thoughtfully. And let me just tell you, when you read the Gettysburg Address, it is American history in one small snapshot took Lincoln a couple minutes to say it. The guy before Lincoln at the Gettysburg Cemetery, uh, the Gettysburg Cemetery is 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 uh, November 19th, 1863. You got to bury the guys. In fact, they had to bury him and then rebury him. Okay. And it's a dedication to memorialize such a contest. Gettysburg, if anything, loomed huge and large in the American mind. It still does today. Lincoln's famous line of why did these men die, Mr. Lincoln, is these men, had, these men did not die in vain. Um, and when you read it, you read it on your own. I want to try to read it to you. I highly suggest you read it. It's really kind of in, in, a, in an hourglass form is what one really smart historian said. You think of the past birth of the country four score or seven years ago, right? Okay. Our, fa our fathers brought forth in this continent. Okay. Right. Dedicated to the proposition of all men are created equal. The birth. Then you get into the second part, the middle part of the of the Gettysburg Address, and it is the present, what they're dealing with at that time, which is about the war. Now we're engaged in this great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived, so dedicated, can long endure. Dedicated to these principles. And so the men that died there is where he's going. What did these men fight for? Uh, the latter part is the future at the end. This new birth of freedom, the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. It is handed over each time to each generation. The Gettysburg Address is the most important thing you can read 
if you want to understand not just American history, but the purpose, the very nature of self-government and the needs, the sacrifice of people. I would pair Gettysburg Address <laughs> with those that hit the beaches in Normandy. Um, now, in the Gettysburg Address, some interesting things. Number one, Lincoln never said union once. He said nation five times. Nation is singular. It's this unification. He never, Lincoln never said north, never said south, never said confederate, never said anything of that nature. It is a unification that all died for the same principles and ideas. And that's what Lincoln is hinting at when the war is over. It is not about inflicting damage on the other, which is weird because civil war is a horrible experience. If you've ever read any other civil wars in history, it is always about get the other guy. Lincoln is really looking forward to saying when it is done, it is for the Americans. It is for us and for the world that these principles exist. The Gettysburg Address needed to be said. At Gettysburg, in three days of engagement, you had the same number of casualties, the same numbers of deaths as you would in the entire Vietnam War for the Americans. It's insane. It's a bloodbath. And it's hard to explain why people die. <laughs> War means you must sacrifice. And Lincoln is extremely clear. The Gettysburg Address is not for just a time period, a place. It is for something more grandiose than that. The nation must survive. Equality is key. It is the principles we live for and live by. It allows us to live next to, next to each other's neighbors, despite any differences of color, creed, religion, etc. Yet it is a, is a wonderful model for the world. <laughs> Otherwise, it's all for what? And this is what the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln said, if you read it, it's so short. I mean, I can't say enough. Someone came to me and said, Gallagher, I need to learn American history. You need to learn it quick. I'd give them a copy of Gettysburg Address. Say, read it, read it many, many times over. It's not just for the Americans. It's for many others. Sorry, I'm fooling around with my notes. But if you want this, I'll send it to you. Just let me know. I'll find a way to get it to you. All right. I think everyone should know this. Okay. Now, after Gettysburg, is the war over? No, Lincoln knew it. Lee still had a, Lee was still out there. Lincoln had to find the man who was going to defeat Lee. Uh, Lincoln is sitting around the table with his um, cabinet, and he's pondering the idea of this guy named Grant. And I love this story where one of his members said, but sir, you can't, you can't be serious about Grant. He's an alcoholic. And Lincoln's reply has been infamous, famous down through the centuries. He says, gentlemen, if you'll tell me the name and the brand of whiskey that Grant drinks, I will gladly give it to all my generals if they'll fight this well. <laughs> I love Lincoln. He's just got a great way to look at things. You know, who, you know, we, we like to do this as well, and I could go on for a long time, you know. It's, you know. No one would ever give Grant a full command once you look at him on paper. But look at what Lincoln done. He'd gone through McClellan. He'd gone through Pope. He'd gone through Burnside. These are the generals. I'm just naming them. He'd gone through, he'd gone through Hooker, fighting Joe, and then he'd gone through Meade. It proves something in, in Grant, and it proves in all of us. You, know, you never know. Be determined. Stick with the guns. Don't give up. You know, trust the process. And it's not that Grant was a butcher. We'll, we'll get into this when we get Vicksburg, and then we'll bring Grant back east. This is, this is a misnomer. Uh, excellent book is Ron Chernow's Grant, and, and as well as H.W. Brand's book on Ulysses Grant. Um, read good history. Uh, don't be afraid. Read a little bit at a time. Uh, history is who we are. It's not something we read. It's 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 in us, <laughs> and, and 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 we can't separate ourselves from it any more than we can separate our you know our, our being, our our soul, uh, or anything of that nature. Our conscience. Um, so anyway, I know I'm going long. It's almost 25 minutes. And I apologize for that. I'm trying to keep them under 20. Uh, and there's so much I'm leaving out about Gettysburg, but I hope uh, that this makes sense to you. There's so many stories I'm leaving. Uh, anyway, uh, I hope you guys are doing safe, stay warm, <laughs> and uh, I will see you. I can't wait to see you again. I miss you. Um, but and I'm growing a little bit. Cause this is this is a civil war. And this was the, this was the time period. Everybody cut and glue this. Okay, so I don't know, but I'm gonna shave probably. All right, so <laughs> this is a, this is of the period. I'm trying to get it thick. I'm trying to look like Grant.
Okay, one of my heroes. All right, you guys be careful. Bye-bye.